Good morning. Today, our Dharma talk will be given by Jika, Lauren Melnikow, a longtime practitioner here at the Zen Center of Syracuse, Hoenji, one of our Dharma teachers, and I am happy to yield to her for the talk. Good morning, everyone. It's really wonderful to see all these kind of glowing faces from everywhere. It's a real treasure to me that we've been able to stay connected through these months and year. It's really a treasure. And it's, you know, whether we're new to the practice or experienced, we all benefit from this practice together, the togetherness that really supports us all. And um, this great treasure of connecting and this great jewel that this is has made me look back on many of the wonderful gifts I've received through this dharma and this practice over like 24 years as a student of Shinge Roshi and now with the threefold sangha, Chigan Roshi, Hokuto Sensei, and all of you. It's so great that the three of us can be together. So as I remember these wonderful breakthrough moments that have been really personal for me and invaluable, I thought that would be a nice thing for me to share today. It will be my own personal journey through some major breakthroughs that have come as great treasures from the practice. So I, I, made, I made a little um, list I'll have to refer to because they're separate while they, although we know that they're not separate but um, each part has been a part of the whole. So I'm gonna begin with Shinge Roshi. Over two years ago, during a Tei show, you began with, <clears throat> it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. Roshi said this was a great way to sum up session, session experience and monastic life experience. <clears throat> I remember my first session at Hoenji in the Zendo once it was completed, newly remodeled from the carriage house. And the great impact I had, we were all sitting in silent Zazen and suddenly this booming voice if not now, when? And that, that was Shinge Roshi and made such an impression on me right away. Like, okay, we've, we've decided to sign up for this. We're here. What are we doing right at this moment? Are we really with it? And it was during the same first in the Zendo session for me that I had another huge impactful breakthrough. And it was the voice of Saigyo, Terry Keenan, who read the Buddha's part during the Diamond Sutra. And when I heard, I'm, I'm just so glad I was paying attention at this moment, because I'm sure through the whole thing, my mind might have wandered, but the moment when he said, if the mind depends on anything, it has no sure haven. That was the first time I heard that and it just 
actually, this was my second session, but the first time I really heard that because my first was up in the attic zendo. Everything was new. Um, Megetsu was my jisha, and I was kindly seated next to her, which was wonderful because she was wonderful. And you just don't forget the moment, first moment, and the jisha who's giving you support. I found out in that session that I needed glasses to see in the dark, um, <laughs> which didn't help because she was trying to show me the page number and I couldn't read it because it was so dark, but she was wonderful. So I didn't, I'm sure we had Diamond Sutra then, but my focus wasn't the same. But when I heard Saigyo read that line, it blew me away. And I knew I shouldn't speak <laughs> when we left the Zendo or be in private, but I happened to pass Saigyo in the shoe room of the Foreman house. And I just could not contain myself. I just whispered and said, I have to know what you read. Where can I find it? At that time, I had no idea. It was every session had Diamond Sutra and it was you know, easily available and repeated each time. But to me, it was like, I just have to find that right now. I have to know where I can get that. That was really memorable. Another really impactful and sim similarly sudden, sudden loud announcement was made during a session by Ensu Scott Rosecrantz, our monk at Hoenji. We were in Kinhin and we had been, you know, I was pretty new, so we're practicing the distance we're walking between, you know, between about a foot between people. And at that moment, I'm thinking, okay, I'm, I'm at the right pace, the right speed. Are we supposed to match our feet with the, everyone or not match our feet left, right? So while I was thinking, okay, I'm kind of doing this all right, he suddenly yelled out, silence your feet. And that was the greatest moment for me because it made me realize that no matter what we think we know about something, what we think we know, or that we're doing it right. Um, at that moment, I realized that applied to everything. And that was just great. It stayed with me for the whole session. You know, often we're learning the form and we're thinking that we know, but now I, have experienced that whenever I think I know, that's time to go deeper. Oh, this same idea was reinforced by Zansan when he returned um, from his monk training in Japan. He was giving us a talk and relating his experiences while he was in training there. And his teacher said something to him that really stuck with him and then stuck with me. And the quote was, whenever you think something should be a certain way, the red light of practice should go on. So as to this deeper thing that you experience when you're hit with one of these wonderful, I'm calling them treasures, I was I returned from uh, my doksan and was sitting in my lineup in the um, Dharma hall. And I sat down and really concentrated because I thought I really hit the target. I thought I hit the bullseye on my presentation on my koan, but it wasn't it, the bell, ding, ding. So I sat there and just said, okay, I got to really use this time. And I did a really strong one pointed concentration. And suddenly, I got it. I, I got the bullseye. I, like I knew for sure there wasn't a doubt. And when I had that, I had a physical experience that my chair sunk deeper into the floor. And I'll never forget that. It, this deepening that comes, we think we know something and office, often, you know, we do understand something on the surface. But then when we continue to practice, that same thing we think we understand never stops deepening. And I think that's an incredible, incredible thing about our practice. You never arrive, 
but things just keep deepening. Such a gift. So I was sitting there and I can still remember it. I know my chair was centered, looking at the center of the fireplace and then boom, it lowered. <laughs> and you don't forget those things. There was a, an article in Time Magazine. It announced the death of W.S. Merwin. He was, I think he was 91. Yes, he died in March of 2019. You probably know that he served as the poet laureate for the United States. It was from 1993 to 1995. The article was entitled Bard of the Ephemeral. It was written by Rita Dove. She was a woman who first got to know him back in the 70s. And then in the 80s, they met again because they attended various literary events. And then in the late 90s, they met again because they were both consultants for the Library of Congress um, bicentennial in 1999. So they met again as old friends. And I wanted to read you a, a little part of this article. This was the heading picture. Once while he was visiting the University of Virginia to give a reading, we were late for dinner and I was rushing. When I suddenly noticed he wasn't beside me anymore, I turned around to find him on the edge of the parking lot, staring into the evening sky. What was wrong, I asked, and he replied, Rita, don't you pay tribute to the moon when she comes out? It might sound funny, but I realized what he meant. Stop and look around, open yourself to wonder. He said, there is just a wisp of the moon. And we stood there for a moment, quiet. His poems illuminate this covenant with the natural world. And they have guided me in determining what should be important in life and to realizing the communication of the ineffable is part of the mission of poetry. Isn't that what every artist tries to do? To articulate that which eludes us? W.S. Merwin knew it and did it better than anyone I knew. So this reminded me of something that Shinge Roshi said that greatly impacted me. She was sharing an experience she had with Dokusan and Soen Roshi. As I remember it, and Roshi can correct anything that's not right. This is just based on my memory. But she said she was on her way to a Dokusan with him and maybe it was her first with him. Um, and she had some trepidation thinking he's gonna see right through me. You know, who am I to go in there? And just felt that he would see her lack of understanding, depth of understanding. And then I believe he either walked out before she got in the door or walked her out the door before she started. So she thought, okay, this uh, is what I was expecting. My fears realized he saw through me, it's kicking me out or we're not gonna do it. And then he stayed with her and they went and simply, he simply pointed up at the moon and shared that moment with her. And that was her wordless Doksan. I always think of that when I'm in the Doksan room and see his picture hanging to the right of us at Hoenji. Just really being present with the moment that something else doesn't take precedent it, or is less important. So the next memory I have was a lunch visit I had with our late Sangha member, Jeanette Powell. We, I used to go to her house um, on a regular basis. She'd make this beautiful lunch and we would talk about many things. She was a very spiritual, brilliant um, person who was always curious and continuing to learn. We were talking about how how we each answer a person who has lost faith 
due to gr some great tragedy that's happened to them. Um, she was in a reading group with her temple and I was doing membership work for the Zen Center. So I get a lot of questions and one that was very common and we both experienced she and her group and I with answering questions was that when someone feels they've been singled out for this tragedy and, and they don't deserve, I don't deserve this. Why did this happen to me? I'm losing faith. I can't believe in anything. I don't know what to do. I've lost grip on my life and who I am because I, this shouldn't have happened. So nothing makes sense. This happened with my father when my mother passed away from cancer. She was only 67 and she was like the most compassionate and naturally, naturally sweet person without trying. She never studied anything about that or read. She just was. And to him, that made no sense. And so he lost faith in everything he ever believed in. And he never regained it. He died five years after, when before that he had no illnesses. And then he developed about four illnesses and died in five years. And it was so sad to see that he never found himself or got out of that mode. He thought that as many of us do, we were raised Catholic. He said, I went to church. I, I didn't, I came straight home. Other men I knew did not do that. I raised these children. He was a great dad. Um, I did everything right. So that means everything should be happy. Everything should turn out as it should. And, you know, I used to think that too. So it's only the practice that, you know, helped me understand that's not the case. <laughs> but he never, I really wanted to help him get to that. My sister tried to help him get to that. My late sister, Leslie Genko, but to no avail. When um, he gave his last words to my children, he said um, to Alex, who is a fabulous strategic poker player on the side, he said, um, better lucky than good. That was his final words to Alex. To Paul Dokyo, he said something that still crushes me because he admired him so much and thought so much of him and would brag about him, not in front of me ever, but I'd hear from his friends bragging and bragging. He got into Brown early, early, you know, early um, acceptance. Nobody gets in, my friend said, but he got in. He, but to Paul, this is what he said, it doesn't work. And that was a sad thing. Uh, and it's made me so appreciate the practice. So back to these people saying, why me? Why me? And I asked Jeanette how she answered that within her groups. And she, she sent me an email of her favorite quote from Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 11. It was in the King James Version of the Bible. And I'll read it. I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to them all. Um, the next thing that was very impactful to me, and by the way, I've, I've found out I have so many of these, I have no idea how far I'll get. And I think first I thought this is going to need a part two, then maybe a part three. And then I thought it might have to be a mini series because so many things have, have been so precious. This was when I was not too long ago, maybe two years ago or so I was viewing the movie made about the 14th Dalai Lama. And when asked, he, you, they show an interview with him. And when he was asked, how do you control your anger? He answered, 
I shout. Not what maybe everyone would expect to hear. And then he went on to say, anger is destroyer of calm mind. So then you realize that that anger is of no use in terms of solving problems. It creates more problems. So continuously thinking along these lines, eventually it becomes habit of your own mind. That is the way to reduce anger. He emphasized that his own experience, I'm reading, so these are exact quotes, recharging through practice, which he described as taking a vow in the presence of Buddha each time you practice. This is the key to not developing anger towards and not losing compassion for those who oppress you. Now, this is coming from a monk, you know, who was imprisoned in a Chinese gulag for 19 years. If anyone deserved to be angry, <laughs> in the sense we would normally just think he would be one. He told the interviewer that during those years, he faced cases of anger. So the interviewer asked, well, what kind of anger? And he said, losing compassion towards Chinese. I just love the simplicity of that. We lost compassion for the Chinese. He pointed to the concentration that he would do on holistic views, altruistic training as making, these are exact words, less development of hatred towards my oppressors. So the next really impactful gift I was given, I wasn't there in person to hear this talk, but I read quotes from it after in a talk that Shinge Roshi gave, it was, this is a priest from Japan who was visiting the United States. And I believe he was at DBZ. And I had the occasion he came for and the year, but I have so many notes, I couldn't locate it in time. But his name is Shiho Fuminori Tsukarhara. And when he, his talk, just had a line in it that helped me so much and I try to keep it in mind all the time. He spoke to the greater Sangha about each of us as being a mirror, just be a mirror. We can truly live as clear reflections of what is in front of us, dropping all opinion and judgment. How beautiful. That always strikes me because I'm a teacher. So from a young age, I was teaching even my little brothers up in the attic, teaching at a blackboard. And so you think that having an opinion and offering it helps the person. That's just natural for me. And I have to work on that all the time. You know, maybe they're not asking for it, <laughs> but you're like, but they, if they'd want to know. And like, no what that I know, what I know is it. But that's something I've always worked on because of my teaching kind of personality. So just to be a mirror, you're sitting with your family member, your friend, they are offering something and you just, you're a mirror. Having no judgment and no opinion on it is, a, it's an amazing look at things and it's so freeing, it's really freeing. So that really stays with me. So another one here that really, uh, these are the ones that like, you know, lead the list. Um, this is a, you know, a treasure we have of the, the Mumon Khan, which is also known as the Gateless Gate. Collection of 48 koans, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, had sat deeply with under the guidance of our teachers. So this is case 26. Two monks roll up the blinds, stating the case, when the monks assembled for the midday meal to listen to his lecture, Hogan pointed at the bamboo blinds. Two monks simultaneously rolled them up. Hogan said, one gain, one loss. 
Oh, I'm looking at the time. This will be a mini series. Mumon's comment. Tell me who gained and who lost. If you have an eye to penetrate the secret, you will see where the name of the temple was mentioned there. Serio, where it failed. However, I want you strongly against discussing gain and loss. This touched me very deeply, very early in my practice because I always felt I offered things for the, the nicest reasons. I never had a negative intent, but sometimes people would misunderstand it. And that was my, I realized that was my attachment. I wanted them to understand it because how could they possibly think the opposite intention of what I had, that I was just trying to offer something nice, not control something, um, not be the boss. Even though intellectually I knew that they were seeing through their own lenses of their life and it wasn't really about me, it still would bother me. And I had to work on that. Why would it bother me? I know that intellectually. I can't make them understand. And with this koan, it really was useful. Why would someone think the opposite? So it still seems sad, even though it was due to their own stuff. So I remember speaking to Shinge Roshi about this and her simple and direct answer was, we don't need to be understood. And <laughs> for me, that was like, okay. Wouldn't it be nice? But no, we don't need to. That's just a, kind of an attachment, isn't it? So this was a whole new way for me to look at things. So back to this koan, there were two lessons that hit home for me. A clear statement in the notes that caught my eye. This is the statement, the secret. There is no gain and no loss. Those who come arguing about right and wrong are those who are enslaved by right and wrong. So yes, why be enslaved? Why be caught up in it? Why waste our energy trying to make it right? And like right in our eyes, what is realizing that to the other person, they're right in their eyes. So the longer I practice, the more I experienced gain, loss, right, wrong, that no two exist. I realized I was renouncing home with home being being right and being understood that it was right and that I just was offering it for a kind reason. I grew up with the reinforcement that being right was good. <laughs> so here we are, right, good. Okay, so we practice being a renouncer of home. Another Dharma gem was to me is Hakuin's exhortations I read each night of Rohatsu. Um, I think you all know Rohatsu, the session that honors the Buddha's enlightenment. Um, this is the, I love this night. The renouncer of home must be a true renouncer of home. To become a true renouncer of home means to uphold a great vow with a daring spirit, thus cutting through the root of life. So we recently witnessed the entrustment of Chigan Roshi, who was then Dokuro Osho at the time. We were present for the ordination of Jishin and Kushu earlier on, President Jikyo's and the late Jisho's, Togan and Muken. They're each a living example of this surrender to choicelessness, of this cutting through entanglements that we've self-created. They're such a great example to us and precious to our whole Sangha with everything they do and give. So this cutting through is the utmost freedom. Um, taking the precepts, we had a recent Jukai class. They're acknowledging their commitment to this path in a public way. And Jukai, I know it translates to um, realize as the precepts, also a synonym for Buddha nature, awaken to this ultimate freedom. So recently we've heard 
because of this great connection here and all the technology, we've heard some real pearls. I keep saying pearls, gems, treasures of wisdom that have been spoken by Shinge Roshi, Chigan Roshi, and Hokuto Sensei. You know, this morning we acknowledge all three of our teachers here and we've been inspired week after week during the past year of the pandemic. This weekend, today, more than the Super Bowl, we honor Black history. Shinge Roshi and her recent Martin Luther King Taisho reminded us that it is pain and fear that fuel the rage of others, that reasoning and arguing doesn't work. In her words, we must instead extend a loving heart or the healing embrace of compassion. Chigan Roshi on our January Mandala Day reminded us that the web of the mandala is not static, that quite the opposite, it is dynamic. He spoke of our role in following this path because we are those entrusted with this dharma. That's a treasure. And Hokuto Sensei in our Martin Luther King session reminded us that every step forward is at least a half step back. He reminded us that all movement is accompanied by those who resist it. This is just a given. His message to us is ongoing, that we must use our faith, our vows, metta, loving kindness and compassion, and that it's only through these means that we can save anyone. So let us remember that we must start with ourselves through our practice, which then makes it possible to move on to all other beings. Okay, I'm gonna do the last thing I wanted to do. Shinge Roshi wrote an inspiration for the newspaper that I thought was the most perfect wording. And so I read it at the end of every um, introduction to Zen class, um, Wednesday nights online at 7 p.m. These were her words, Getting some better light here. Small print. Most of us come to spiritual practice because we yearn to understand the great mystery at the heart of things. We sense that there's something more to life than conventional reality. We may have been inspired by sacred teachings, but at a certain point, we want to know for oneself whether the water is cool or warm. As the Zen saying goes, we want the direct experience, not someone else's impression. So we may take up the practice of meditation, imagining that we'll enter a calm, lucid, tranquil space. But it isn't long before we discover that the mind is filled up to the brim with thoughts, all of which revolve around oneself and one's interactions. Judgmental assessments, replays of conversations, fantasies, narrative of all sorts play out in a jumbled, incoherent muddle. Then we may say, oh, I'm a failure at meditation. We don't realize, what we don't realize is that this is completely natural. The mental congestion is a temporary condition as we continue, the traffic jam clears and the mind grows more spacious. There's no right and wrong in meditation. Perseverance is simply a matter of paying attention. We focus on each exhalation all the way to the end, again and again returning to the breath. We listen, not to anything specific, just 360 degrees listening to the sounds around us and we enter into the interplay between silence and sound. Then perhaps for just a moment or two, there's nothing in the way. Then what? Usually what happens next is that the wide open space is noticed and the unlimited awareness of awareness falls into self-consciousness, into commentary, and we're back to the traffic again. 
But now we know we can relax into just breathing, just listening, just being. The more we practice this, the more natural it becomes. So let us keep our practice, continue on and support each other in this way. So thank you, Dika and everyone who has uh, been sharing their experiences and everything just goes so naturally together. And that brings us to our concluding great vows for all.